This is the Psychcast by MD Edge, where we bring you conversations with leaders in the fields of psychiatry and psychology, masterclass lectures, and inspiration straight to your ears, with new episodes dropping on Wednesdays. And welcome to episode 114 of the Sightcast by MD Edge. I am the voice of MD Edge podcast, Nick Andrews, and I'm joined this week by Dr. Lorenzo Norris, editor in chief of MD Edge Psychiatry and the host of the Sightcast by MD Edge. Dr. Norris, uh, as COVID, we did COVID, 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 COVID. On one hand, you're sick of talking about it. On the other hand, we're just sort of waiting for the other shoe to drop as, as a re- in regards to you know the mental health fallout that we know is happening and, and is on the way. We know that the mental health ramifications are on the way in regards to COVID. And it seems as though we've been talking about COVID for uh, ever. I mean, in many ways we have, but it's really probably been like between five to eight weeks or so. Um, But the mental health effects are absolutely on the way. Uh, At MD Edge, um, I would encourage everyone to take a real look at our our website. We have constant updates in regards to coronavirus. Uh, Our new section, uh, uh, Clinical Psychiatric News, is giving you the most up-to-date news as possible, as well as our current psychiatry is really giving you huge updates in regards to uh, COVID. And I would actually encourage a lot of people to really take a look at Dr. Henry Nasrallah's, um, um, if you will, piece or editorial piece in terms of the COVID pandemic. Yeah. I, I want folks to give that a read and take a look at it on the MDA site. But yes, we all, you hit the nail around the head, uh, Nick. I mean, the mental health aspects of this are just starting and it's really after any disaster or any type of large scale event right. the mental health piece is huge and we don't want to just flood your ears with covid stuff but that's something that is going to be very important and we're going to continue to do that we did it last episode on episode 113 with dr jacqueline posada and we will continue to do that in the future but this week we have something rather exciting so for those of you that don't know md edge which is a media brand is owned and operated by the same parent company that owns and operates medscape medscape md edge are partnering with Ted Med of TED Talks, Ted Med from Boston 2020. We went up there, we got five or six interviews that we are going to be airing on the Sitecast, and we kick off this collaboration with Ted this week. Our guest is Dr. Cheryl King. I was fortunate enough to go up to Boston and and attend all the talks, and I got to speak with her one-on-one in a hotel room, and it was was quite enlightening. Her, Her work, many people will be familiar with it, is on teen suicide risk and a specific screening tool that uses algorithms and questionnaires. And Dr. Norris, this is so important. These, this population is so at it, risk it, and so heartbreaking. One, the collaboration between MD Edge and TED is, um, as well as, I'm sorry, Medscape and TED and consequently MD Edge is phenomenal. And then uh, obviously, most importantly, you are correct in regards to the epidemic. I, I mean, the word is kind of overused, sure. um, but in regards to what we're seeing in terms of teen suicide, we know that suicide is the leading cause of death for youth ages 10 to 19 years old. We know that the suicide rates have been increasing um, since roughly since, I want to say since 2000 in the age range of uh, 10 and 19 year olds by 53%. This is shattering. This is um, this, you don't really have words for it. Um, And we know that um, 500 youth approximately between the ages of 10 and 14 die by suicide. Um, And we also know that approximately about 2,500 youth between the ages of 15 and 19 year olds uh, die by suicide. So this is something we absolutely need um, to address. We need to be vigorous and passionate about one, how we screen, how we detect, and most importantly, how we prevent. So Dr. King uh, and her group at the University of Michigan are at the absolute forefront of this. And I would certainly yeah. encourage anyone, if you have not looked at Dr. King's research or you've not reviewed her TED talk or looked at some of the work that she has done, you most certainly uh, should, particularly as it relates to the com- uh, computerized adaptive screen for suicide risk. So she's got a number of studies going on and she's actually part of a NIH funded grant looking at the use of a CAS computerized adaptive screen for suicide risk um, in emergency room settings. So um, again, I would encourage everyone, listen to this talk, re- look up Dr. King, and just make yourself knowledgeable in regards to this like yeah, person who's really, really doing so much. 
Yeah, she's been working on this her whole career, and of course she mentions yeah. that in, in the conversation. If you have any thoughts on this episode or other episodes, or if you have any thoughts on how we should cover COVID, what you're experiencing in your clinic or in your classroom or with your residents or fellows or what have you, please email us at podcast at mdh.com. We would love to hear from you. This is your medium. This is a podcaster on demand. You vote for it every time you listen to it. So if you want to hear something or if you want to say something, we encourage you to do that. You can also find us on Twitter at MDH Psych, of course, the email address and the Twitter account are available via link in the podcast notes. We have other TED interviews coming up. The collaboration with TED is all about content. Make that very clear. And all of it, we try to make a clinical angle. Topics includes uh, psychedelics as therapy at Johns Hopkins University. Very exciting stuff. Um, and a bunch of other stuff. So that's coming this spring and this summer right here at MD Edge. And we're going to kick off the first one coming up right after this. Dr. Norris, thanks so much. Thank you as always, Nick. Welcome back to the Sidecast by MD Edge. I am Nick Andrews. Before we get to my interview with Dr. Cheryl King, a look at episode 115 on the Sidecast. It was a 16-year-old boy who told me as I was evaluating him that he sat in a bathroom stall every day at lunch because he was too overwhelmed to go into the cafeteria. And this kid who was a handsome kid, lovely had no friends that he hung out with. He hadn't done anything extracurricular at school. And when I got finished evaluating him, his parents had brought him in, I asked him what he wanted to do with the rest, you know, five years from now where he saw himself. And he looked at me and he looked at me and said, if these are supposed to be the best years of my life, I don't want to be alive. It's time now for my interview with Dr. Cheryl King from TED Med 2020 in Boston, Massachusetts. Cheryl King. I am a clinical psychologist and a professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Michigan Medicine, which is the academic health system at the University of Michigan. We're here at TED Med 2020 in Boston. We've got this nice hotel room. We're all relaxed and kind of jump into some of the things that that you do and and specifically get started on, on a screening tool that is in development for emergency suicide among adolescents. Can you just tell me what that is and where, where you are in the process? Yes, we're developing a, a personalized adaptive suicide risk screen for teens, which is different than the, teen, the screens we have available now um, because it's based on computerized algorithms. So what we have done is working with a really large network of pediatric emergency departments, PCARN, the Pediatric Emergency Care Applied Research Network, we have been able to have thousands of teens complete a suicide risk survey and then based on their responses, figure out what was related to who made a suicide attempt within the next three months. And because it was such a large number of teens, it was possible to develop computerized algorithms so that in the final screen, the questions teens are asked depend on their response to previous questions. So it's easier to tailor it or make it adaptive um, for each teen. They're not all getting the same questions. That's really fascinating to me where, because you've got, you've got the, the generalized algorithm, but then because it's adaptive, it's like your own personal or a patient's own personal journey. And because it's adaptive, uh, you get both the large picture, but also the individualized um, approach to a specific patient. And, how my question is how uh, how has it gone so far? How what's the success been like, and and how can this um, impact boots on the ground clinical psychiatry in you know the next two to five years? So the screen that we've developed looks good. Um, we're doing a second validation, but uh, out of the gate, it's looking very strong. Um, it differs from our more classical or traditional screens because they ask the same number of questions to everyone. So in terms of the accuracy for the individual, it's not quite as strong. Uh, We have compared it to a currently available screen, which is actually quite good, the ASQ. And it does outperform that in terms of the classification accuracy. 
the accuracy of figuring out if you have a suicide attempt risk. Now, there's a couple of things we think about with these screens. One is its sensitivity. Does it actually pick up everyone who's at risk? And the other is its specificity, sure. meaning we don't want too many false positives. We don't want to pick up a lot of teens not at risk because it's a big workload for the emergency department to come in and do these mental health evaluations. Um, the ASQ and the one we developed, which we're calling the CASI, Computerized Adaptive Screen for Suicidal Youth, um, have comparable sensitivity in some ways. But what's unique about the one we've developed, it doesn't have as many false positives. Wow. That's uh, obviously pretty encouraging. That sort of specificity and that accuracy could probably make a big difference to emergency departments. And I imagine to the entire care team, because you've got the emergency department, uh, pediatrician, and and, uh, a psychiatry component as well. So I guess this is pretty exciting stuff um, in terms of the way the field is moving, but... Uh, how did you get started on this, and what was your motivation to kind of look into this? You said you did the research to kind of find out the questions and how the algorithm works, but when, what was the genesis of this for you? Yeah, for me, I've been working um, as a clinical scientist on teen suicide prevention for a very long time, working on developing screening approaches, risk assessment, um, understanding, and interventions for teens at risk for suicide. And one thing in the last 20, 25 years of research, we'd really already established the risk factors. Sure. You know, what, what's putting these teens at risk? But there are many of them because teens who are suicidal make up a really heterogeneous group of people. A lot of different combinations of risk factors can make a teen suicidal. So it seemed like we were at a place where we could actually survey them for all of these and then from that develop algorithms, the different patterns or profiles of risk and do a better job at screening than we had done previously. So some of it is just um, the area I've been working in, but it's also the timing. We were ready to do this now. Yeah, no, that um, it seems like it's a really advantageous moment for this to happen. So uh, just walk me through the process of someone is screened with this new Cassie and they screen positive and it seems to be, um, is, are there different levels of, of positivity where this is a lot of red flags and then what happens to the patient? What's the next step for the care team in the emergency department? A really important next step is to develop these, these triage algorithms or the decision points for when is a mental health evaluation indicated? When is it a second tier set of questions to decide if we need a full mental health evaluation? But the way the CASI works, you actually get a level of risk. It's continuous. So it's not a yes, no screen. This teen's at risk. You can uh, set a different level. So presumably an emergency department could say, this is our comfort level where if a teen scores above this, we want to bring in a mental health professional to do a full evaluation, and we have the resources to manage it at this level. So we may end up making some recommendations, for instance, three tiers, no risk, um, moderate, medium risk. These youth, higher risk, more acute, you really want to be sure that you look closely at but I think it would also be left where an emergency department could, um, the providers, the system could make some of their own decisions about the level that they might want to use. Yeah, no, that makes sense to me as well. Okay, so, um, and I, I'm claiming ignorance here, but could you talk to me about how someone experiencing these symptoms winds up in an emergency department in the first place? Uh, in, in terms of an adolescent, you don't often, or I don't, just as a layperson, often think about uh, a mental health emergency the way I think of my, my ankle is broken, um, I have the flu, where you would run to the ED right away. But when, when is it a mental health uh, situation that takes someone to the ED? Or is it a screen that can be applied to anyone with any sort of suspicion that winds up in the ED for another reason, say a drug overdose? Yeah, the CASI, the screen that we are developing, is intended to be a universal screen. Mm-hmm. Uh, for use in general medical emergency departments, pediatric emergency departments. It could be used in psychiatric emergency departments, which tend to be in academic health systems where they have that more specialized kind of emergency service. 
But generally, if someone comes in with a psychiatric chief complaint, the provider will conduct a full evaluation and assess for suicide risk. So some of our intent in developing this is to screen those who aren't coming in for suicide risk and find the risk that's out there. Because many teens who die by suicide um, have never had any mental health services before. Mm -hmm. And as many as half of the teens who die by suicide die on their first suicide attempt. So trying to proactively find the, the youth at risk, the boys and girls, but it's maybe especially important to find the boys at risk because um, they are just less likely to come in for mental health services. Um, in our psychiatric hospitals, if we look at teens who've been hospitalized for suicide risk, it's often two-thirds girls and one-third boys. And yet if you look at who dies by suicide in these years in the United States, 75% of the teen young adult suicide deaths are males. They're the boys. Oh, that's incredible. What, is, what a number. Um, so what is the, I don't want to ask for a specific timeline, but what's the likelihood that this is available to the general uh, practicing public in the next 12 to 36 months? Yeah, I think it's very likely that we'll get it out within that time frame, um, definitely within three years. I think emergency departments will make choices. The CASI does require, require um, you might be editing, the sure. CASI does require uh, integration with software. It's a program. Um, can, you tell, or, can you specify on that program software? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it can, could be integrated into an EPIC or an electronic health record gotcha. system at a cost, or an emergency department could um, make a an agreement with a company that distributes it to directly program it separately from EPIC. I think many hospital systems like to integrate these tools into their electronic health record, but there would be options. And emergency departments that didn't want to take that step or take that step yet to begin using the CASI, there are still these other tools that are sure. also very good, like the ASQ. Okay, now that, that makes sense to me. So available, oh, pardon me, <coughs> available soon, um, possibly not widespread integration until you know, different hospitals make their different financial. Right. Um, and it, there's more. To, I, I worked um, integrating Thomas Jefferson University with Epic, and it was quite the challenge to get everybody on board and turn the lights on. So I, there's a lot of work that goes into it, and it costs you know, a lot of money and time. And uh, Okay, but if it's going to be available, say that uh, a patient does or does not screen positive at the age of 15, 16, 17, as they transition into young adulthood and adulthood, uh what is this screening working well look like? At what point does the risk go up or down? And, and what is successful treatment after someone screens positive? Because the idea is to use this to identify someone that maybe wasn't showing signs. And then they're identified and they're treated appropriately. How does the this assessment here impact them for the next 10 years or so as they transition? I mean, that's really the key question. And screening for risk for anything, including suicide, is only meaningful if we do something with those who screen positive. And, you know, this is a challenge, but we do have some tools now. So, for instance, uh, it's very common after there is a mental health evaluation or a brief evaluation um, by the emergency department providers um, that a safety plan is developed with the teen. This is one of our evidence-based tools. Sure where it's like a crisis response plan, where you identify with the teen, if you're feeling like this again, you have these thoughts, you're this miserable, whatever words they use, they come up with a plan. You know, where who could they turn to? What could they do to distract their, themselves if there isn't a problem that can be solved? But it, you go through a series of steps to develop, but really it's a coping plan. Sure. So that's one tool. And then, of course, we have our evidence-based treatments and medications for their presenting problems. And we're beginning to develop some psychotherapies that are really targeted towards suicide risk. There is one um, that we think is a safety planning intervention that incorporates the safety plan development 
together with a fairly brief therapy that involves the teen and the family and really helps transition them from the emergency department back to the community, focusing on support and coping and family communication. And there's some positive data coming out about that. And then the youth-nominated support team that our team developed, uh, where we really are harnessing the strength of the adults in the teen's family and community Mm -hmm. to bolster our usual treatments medication and therapy. And in this intervention, the teens nominate adults they trust and would like to have more involved in their lives. And we actually work with those adults to help them support the teen. And that's also looking uh, to have very good long-term outcomes. Yeah, sure. I guess incorporating more people where there is already trust and then giving those people training obviously seems so important to me. It's, it's a fearful thing for someone who doesn't have training to say, I don't know what to say. Mm-hmm. I can't, I don't want to make it worse. Mm-hmm. Right. So that, that seems very important to me. I want to switch gears a little bit and just ask you openly uh, to tell us a little bit more about yourself. Where'd you go to undergrad? Where'd you go to grad school and kind of how did uh, your career wind up where it is? Mm-hmm. Well, I was born in Detroit, Michigan, grew up in the suburbs of Michigan. Not South Detroit, though. That's not a real neighborhood, right? (laughs) And went to the University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. Um, So I am a Wolverine fan. Um, I did travel after that. I did my doctoral training in Bloomington, Indiana, at Indiana University. Then I spent some time in Madison, Wisconsin, and then came back. And it's actually a treat to come back and be a professor where you were an undergrad, and I have been on the faculty at Michigan since 1989. Oh. So I'm a long timer at Michigan and definitely <laughs> a, staple. A, a loyal. A lo- yeah, well, <laughs> a loyal I noticed those, you said some uh, Big Ten buzzwords in the other places where you live, so I imagine. <laughs> I, Madison and, and Bloomington are fine places to live as well. I'm a, I have roots in Michigan myself, um, in the South Park, Muskegon, mm-hmm. and, and um, Central Michigan as well. So I, I identify with the fandom that happens in, in that particular state. So you're moving around and, and you find this passion to, to work with this patient population and, and work um, trying to prevent and screen, et cetera. But what else are you doing? We've spent a lot of time talking about Cassie, but what, uh, what else is going on for you? You know, one of our biggest projects right now, uh, which is funded by the National Institute of Mental Health, is to identify 24-hour warning signs for teen suicide attempts. Uh, And we do this by following them for a long period of time with text message surveys, where every couple of weeks, they're just responding to a brief number of questions about about their mood, their support, any sleep disturbance, alcohol, drug use. And in there, we have a question about whether they've made a suicide attempt. And if they say yes, we have interviewers contacting them and their parents to to hear about what was going on the 24 hours before that and the 24 hours before that Uh. when they didn't make a suicide attempt, but they probably really had all the same risk factors. Yeah, Yeah, a lot of the same things were happening in their life. And it's called a case crossover design, but it's really comparing those periods. And then we're also interviewing a lot of teens who haven't made an attempt just to compare the two groups. And this study is just finishing up this year, and we hope within the year to have our findings out so we can share them with parents and others. Here are the warning signs to look for. Well, yeah, when this is the, what valuable information uh, that will be. I'm um, uh, aggressively waiting those results. That'll be very fun, but it's something that we'll cover at, at MD Edge for uh, for sure. So, what are the next um, what are the next five years look like? Obviously, you've got this research coming out. You're looking at algorithms. I sort of suspect that. Mining social media data will provide a lot in terms of risk factors, but a lot of excitement uh, in terms of screening and the suicide emergency 24 hours before an attempt. But what do the next five years look like in, in prevention, in uh, specifically among adolescents? Mm-hmm. I think there will be more work in how we combine the screening tools with interventions. In the emergency department, brief interventions, but then also what's to follow. How sure. can we use technology? Um, There's more and more work being done. Is there a way we can use text message boosters? Is there a way we can um, track how people are doing passively with their watches, with their cell phones? So we're going to learn more about what do we do after we screen them 
and can technology help us do that better? I think another area that we're going, uh, we're certainly working more on the youth nominated support team because it has been associated now with reduced early mortality. So we will look now, how can we implement this in emergency departments? In our original study, we implemented it with teens who were psychiatrically hospitalized. Might it be beneficial to use with teens who come in to outpatient clinics Mm. and are being treated for suicide risk? So there's a lot of potential to adapt and expand. And again, also there to probably integrate more technology to make it easier to disseminate broadly and to actually hold um, the interest and the engagement of the teens and families. Yeah, if a tree falls in the forest, yeah, absolutely. And, and getting it from the emergency department to the outpatient psychiatric clinic and the pediatrician, I, I, uh, if everybody, if nobody has it, like I said, tree falls in the forest and no one can hear it, it doesn't matter at all. So I guess the next five years you're saying make it, make action come of this. Right. Absolutely. Learn how to integrate the tools and interventions we've already developed so that a teen gets the full package of what they need and then get those packages that we find to be effective out into all the settings that are caring for treating these teens. Well, uh, Dr. Cheryl King, you've been a great guest. This has been very helpful and meaningful and exciting in terms of Let's see what's going to happen when this research comes out. Let's see Cassie out in the field. And uh, I'm, I thank you very much for stopping by on MD Edge and Medscape. Appreciate it. Thank you. Happy to participate. This concludes episode 114 of the Sitecast by MD Edge. Episode 114 was a collaboration between MD Edge, Medscape, and Ted Med. The Sitecast is produced by MD Edge editors Gina Henderson and Jeff Bauer. Our guest this week was Dr. Cheryl King, PhD, University of Michigan. The editor-in-chief of MD Edge Psychiatry and the host of this show is Dr. Lorenzo Norris. All of our podcasts are produced by MD Edge and Medscape editor-in-chief Dr. Ivan Aransky, as well as MD Edge executive editors Kathy Scarbeck and Mary Ellen Schneider, and multimedia editor Terry Rudd. Social media is produced by Kyla Clark. Special thanks to Crystal Nadani of Medscape and WebMD. I'm your audio engineer, audio editor, and the interviewer for this episode, Nick Andrews. This is the Sitecast by MD Edge.